please. I, I <laughs> would like to say something because I, I wanted to make sure. Are good. <laughs> I wanted to make sure and and get something from uh, both sides of the state, you know. So because CDs are statewide, and I wanted to make sure and get something. And and so I contacted Heather and I asked around, and and somebody said this was a great example of what they're doing over there in in water conservation, which because they don't have as much rain as us in the west side. Like we've been, I, and I want to say Heather, I. I had to come across the state Sunday coming back from Salt Lake. So I drove and I so bad wanted to search out Heritage Garden and go look for it, but I was in a rush to get back. So I'm going to come back sometime. But uh, um, that was because I was right there. And I just want to say, yeah, it was, uh, it's a beautiful area down there. And, the, and, and so Heather is a, you know, I want to tell you, she's a conservationist and the co-creator of the Heritage Garden program. And uh, she's also the co-author of the plant selection guide for Heritage Gardens of the Columbia River Basin. Um, Heather has worked for the Conservation District since 1997. She currently serves as the Assistant Manager for both Benton and Franklin Conservation Districts. She's responsible for coordinating the Heritage Garden Program in Benton, Franklin, Yakima Counties. Um, Heather lives in Kennewick with her husband, Greg, daughter, Ali, and their mini Aussie Flint. And, and you know, Heather's always popping up. She's, she's doing that. She's, again, a mover and shaker, a doer. And I just want to say thanks, Heather, for all you do for conservation. Around, around the state and everywhere because you support a whole bunch of us doing a lot of things. So with that, Heather, here you go. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful in, uh, introduction, Bill. Much, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so uh, I just want to couch today's presentation, whether you're on the west side or you're on the east side, hopefully you'll be able to take away uh, some, some key concepts. Uh, from our Heritage Garden program, um, because really, you know, Heritage Gardens are not specific to the Columbia Basin. You could yourselves create, you know, for example, Heritage Gardens of the Puget Sound and incorporate this concept into your rain gardens or Heritage Gardens of the Palouse. So uh, if you're watching this presentation today, uh, really think about how you can sort of incorporate some of these concepts into programs that you already have to augment them or to create your own program. Program. So Heritage Gardens, um, this was a program that we created in 2010 in partnership with the Columbia Basin Chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society. Um, when I started working for Benton Conservation District oh, in 2009, I had already been working for Franklin CD for many, many years. Um, they wanted us to start promoting xeriscaping, low water use landscaping, because in Benton, um, they had the cities, they had Kennewick and Richland and West Richland that they needed to provide services to. And they thought an urban water conservation program uh, would be beneficial. And so of course, being the plant person on staff, uh, I was uh, thrilled with the idea of, of bringing forth this concept. And so I very excitedly went out into the community and I said, I am going to bring you Xeriscaping and here's this great idea. And the landowners I talked to were like, ugh, gross, brown, yuck, we don't want to talk about it. And I was a little dejected. Um, and then I uh, met Donna Lucas with the Native Plant Society. And she said, Heather, if you call it a garden, they will come. And, uh, and I just thought that that was just a brilliant concept. So Donna, um, and there's Donna and I, in the photograph there. Um, and if you notice one thing about plant people, um, we're always looking down pointing at the ground, that's just what we do, uh, based, you know, versus birders, right? They're always looking up. Um, but there's Donna and I standing in a heritage garden. Um, and we basically spent 18 months developing the criteria for this program because we did not have a formalized program uh, in our area where we were talking about incorporating native plants. And the last thing we wanted to have happen was for people to not be successful. So we were very cautious uh, when we uh, approached developing this particular program. So what are heritage gardens? Heritage gardens are landscaped areas designed to honor the cultural and natural heritage of the Columbia River Basin while utilizing sustainable gardening practices. So we are talking about landscaping. We're not talking about restoration. Uh, there is a really big difference. Um, our areas are planned uh, for the most part, um, but you can achieve many different types of aesthetics 
uh, with these types of landscapes, and we'll see that here in a, a bit. So what is the purpose of the Heritage Garden Program? We wanted to promote the use of native plants, especially those that are culturally significant, promote low water use landscaping and efficient irrigation methods. Again, that's kind of getting to the conservation district's water conservation. And we really wanted to use this program as an opportunity to educate our community about the history and biodiversity of the Columbia River Basin. No matter where you are in the state, your area is unique. And so really playing off of those different aspects that makes your area unique to you um, is a great opportunity um, to really you know, incorporate that education piece. So when we created the Heritage Garden Program, uh, we came up with four primary criteria. Uh, we wanted to work with the flora, the fauna. We wanted to incorporate local geology and also the cultural significance of the plants that we were incorporating. And we created a formal certification checklist. So there are, there are criteria and we formalized that, that criteria. And we created required practices. And then we also had some recommended or some best practices uh, for individuals to consider when they were creating these type of gardens. So when we talk about the plants, so the minimum criteria, we wanted to have at least five different species of plants. We have some biodiversity. 75% um, of those plants need to be native to Washington state. Now this is kind of interesting. You notice we didn't say 100%, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. 30% of the plants in a heritage garden need to have a water requirement of less than 10 inches, which would be for our area, would be plants that once they're established, we're not watering them. They're existing in the landscape, and really we're not fussing with them much at all. And then no more than 10% can have a water requirement of greater than 30 inches. And we added this component to be inclusive. We don't want to exclude anyone. So if there was a garden area where great grandma, right, we have great grandma's plant, um, and you'd be tremendously surprised at how many people have plants that are um, significant to, to their family. Um, they've planted them. They represent someone who's passed away. We didn't want to exclude right, those, those plants, and we actually uh, work very hard to sort of incorporate that small percentage that might just need you know, that higher, higher amount of uh, water. Um, fauna, uh, we wanted to include, include at least two plants that have wildlife value. This is extremely easy to do. Anything that blooms is great for pollinators. Uh, so it's a very uh, easy criteria. But again, we're really looking at this uh, as an opportunity to educate our landowners. Um, so we have a painted lady on uh, Douglas's Dusty Maiden there, um, that beautiful butterfly on the native plant. And then um, I believe that's a white crown sparrow on sagebrush. I like to take these pictures, um, I'm not a birder, so I like to take presentations and I put lots of photos of uh, birds in them and then I go to the Audubon Society and uh, do a presentation for them and then it's a great quiz and I, and I learn what's in all of my photos. Uh, the cultural significance of, of native plants. So we wanted to pay homage, obviously, to, to how culturally significant these plants are um, uh, to the indigenous peoples. Um, so we included plants that were used for food, uh, fiber, shelter, medicine to the indigenous peoples. Um, we also are in our particular area in most of the state. Um, we paid homage to the early explorers and botanists. Um, including uh, species noted uh, during the Meriwether uh, and Meriwether Lewis's journals from the Lewis and Clark expedition um, and other early botanists. So we try to incorporate at least uh, one plant species that is culturally significant. And again, we've done all of this research for our homeowners. They're not doing this research. We're basically telling them, uh, giving them that information uh, so that they know uh, what they're incorporating in their gardens. And geology, from basalt flows to ice age floods, 
um, the Columbia River Basin is just an amazing, amazing region as far as the geology is concerned. Um, and so we try to include at least one geologic feature in our heritage gardens. Now you don't have to have these big, beautiful basalt columns. Uh, they're extremely expensive, uh, absolutely not. Um, but just using uh, native basalt mulch um, to uh, cover the ground in the flower beds themselves. Uh, oftentimes our homeowners will incorporate pathways into their garden, so we can use crushed basalt for that. Um, Ice Age flood deposit erratics, if they have them on site, that's great. Uh, river rock, um, and this kind of goes, uh, a lot of our homeowners uh, will often include um, dry riverbeds just to add sort of, uh, you know, an aesthetic value to their gardens. Um, and so river rock is a, a wonderful way to, uh, you know, incorporate that into, into our gardens. You can even use basalt for benches. And we have some public gardens that have used some very beautiful basalt slabs as benches. Um, and I even have some homeowners who use their dry riverbeds uh, to collect water, uh, roof runoff uh, in their downspouts, and they divert that into, into their dry riverbeds to um, basically for infiltration purposes. Uh, so we do a little bit of stormwater out here in the desert as well. So those are the criteria. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the specific plants, but before I do that, uh, do we have any questions so far? Any questions about Nothing the criteria? Yet. Okay. So if you have questions about the criteria or how we developed the program or why we developed the program we, we, the way that we did, feel free to feel free to ask those. If we don't have questions, I will talk more about the plants. Um, Heather, I do have a question actually. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it will spark some thought too as mm -hmm. well from, from the attendees. Remember you can um, raise your hand to unmute yourself and ask the question directly um, or type in your question in the questions box. My question for you is, we're because um, I just got done with a cultural resources course for my planning certification. Um, so learning about kind of that cultural heritage aspect. Um, mm -hmm. Did you guys involve like the indigenous folks um, in the design criteria or do you have plans to? We did. When we first uh, started the process, we did uh, invite our local tribes to review our plant list and cool. to provide comments. They, they did not choose to do, to do so, um, but I will tell you um, that we have received grants uh, from uh, some of our uh, local tribes uh, to do this type of work in public gardens. So they are supporting the work that we do. Uh, they just chose not to to provide direct comment. Um, and in, in addition to providing grants, when we started uh, offering this program in Yakima County, it was um, just amazing. One of the first uh, people to reach out to us was the Yakima Nation. And they wanted us to come to help them incorporate native plants into the landscapes around their facilities and their buildings. Um, so that was that was very heartwarming for us. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So we're going to talk about plants. Um, so I just wanted to provide uh, some examples of some of my favorite plants and some of the information that we provide uh, to homeowners. Um, the plant that you see before you, this is purple sage. It's actually a salvia, not, not a true sage. Um, and so the information we, we provide to homeowners is, uh, you know, is it a forb? Is it a shrub? Uh, how much water does that plant need? Um, this particular uh, species uh, can, can basically be less than 10 inches to 14 inches, so it does have a wider range. Um, it does require full sun. It's native to Washington State and specifically to the Columbia Basin. It gets around 30 inches tall and 30 inches wide, and it is a beautiful silvery mounding shrub. Um, and as you can see, it gets these beautiful spikes of purple flowers in late spring. In our book, um, we do we use the same symbols that you see on the screen to uh, as a quick reference guide. 
Uh, so this plant, uh, pollinators love this plant. It attracts hummingbirds and butterflies. Uh, and it was used by many tribes of, as for medicinal uh, purposes. Uh, but it's an absolutely phenomenal uh, native plant. Uh, and in the book, I can tell you a little bit more about the plant. Um, salvia uh, comes from the Latin word salvus, meaning safe, well, and sound. And Dory honors Clarendon Herbert Dorr, who lived from 1816 to 1887, who was a poet and an inventor. So I, I love researching these plants. We've done a lot of research. And there's a lot of, uh, when you read about the plants, you really learn a lot more about their history, uh, which, is, which is fun for plant geeks like myself. Uh, sulfur buckwheat. Oh my goodness, buckwheats are incredibly important pollinator plants. Uh, this is another one of my favorite plants. Um, it's a, a wildflower. Um, it can survive on less than 10 inches, uh, so we don't have to provide it supplemental water. I tend to give it a little bit of extra water in the garden. It just means that it just blooms more prolifically, uh, but not too much. That's that's the, the line in the sand we, <laughs> we have to draw with our natives. Oftentimes our homeowners uh, run the risk of overwatering if they have supplemental irrigation, like a drip system, for example. Um, so we really have to work uh, with our landowners that they, they don't give their plants too much love because they really don't need it or want it. Uh, but this is a beautiful compact plant. Uh, it can be mat forming and be about three feet wide, but it only gets about 12 inches tall uh, and blooms in late summer, uh, I'm sorry, uh, late spring, early summer. Um, that rabbit symbol, don't let that fool you. It is not going to attract rabbits to the garden. It just means that uh, mammals uh, do, uh, you know, utilize the plants or probably eat the seeds and things of that nature. Um, but again, great for pollinators, extremely important. Um, my favorite thing about uh, sulfur buckwheat is that the leaves are, are, are leathery and they stay green all year. Um, so it's nice to have a plant where we have a lot of silvers and grays in our landscapes with, uh, with our native plants. But this is one that has that dark green, uh, evergreen type leaves. And so it provides some nice contrast to that silver gray color that we often see. Monroe's globe mallow. Um, I mean, this is just, if you're, if you're driving through the basin and you see a pop of orange off to the side, um, it's probably going to be Monroe's Globe Mallow. Uh, this one we really don't normally provide extra water to. You can. If you do, it gets really, really large. <laughs> I mean, almost up to my waist kind of large um, and gorgeous, but, uh, but it doesn't need to be that large. Uh, but it, it blooms all summer long. Uh, and uh, again, absolutely gorgeous plant. Uh, pollinators love this plant. When you plant native plant gardens, one of my favorite things to do is to go out early in the morning. And if you look at uh, the petals of your plants and you look inside, you'll often find bees resting in there waiting for it to warm up. Uh, and so before they start flying around and uh, globe mallow is especially nice because it creates a little cup, a little petals of the flowers and you can go out and look for pollinators first thing in the morning. I tell my homeowners this and you'd be surprised at how many emails I get. Um, they're like, we found one, <laughs> sleeping, waiting. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fun thing you can do with your, uh, with your plants. Um, so again, very drought tolerant, very easy to grow. One of the things we do tell folks is with natives, they're really good at propagating. So we have to be a little bit careful about which plants we recommend, um, just because, you know, some plants, for example, like our native yarrow, um, yes, you will have a lot of it, but so will your neighbor. And your neighbor may not want that in their landscape. Uh, so we tend to let homeowners know uh, sort of the growth habits of the plants, not only how beautiful they are, but also if you can expect them to reseed and how readily you can expect them to reseed. So globe mallow reseeds itself, but not aggressively. And it's one that, oh gosh darn, I have another globe mallow in my landscape, shucks, lucky you. Oregon sunshine, oh my gosh, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous uh, native plant. 
I do give this one a little bit of extra water, um, but again, it blooms in the spring. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, this one was noted uh, during the Lewis and Clark expedition. So this is one of our Lewis and Clark plants. Uh, showy yellow flowers. Uh, one thing I noted about this particular plant is we tend to uh, treat it like an annual or a biennial because it is short-lived and it does need to reseed. And it's important for homeowners to know that. Uh, so this one works great in the landscape. Uh, if you cut, if you use landscape fabric, you just need to cut a large enough hole in that fabric to allow that plant to reseed right there. And when the parent plant dies, you just pull it out and you have lots of little seedlings to take its place. Uh, so it's a little, it's these little tips and tricks that we provide our homeowners so that they're successful with incorporating these native plants into their landscapes. Fragrant Evening Primrose, um, oh my gosh, this is absolutely a gorgeous plant. Again, we provide this one with a little bit of extra water. Um, and so this one has more glossy green leaves than the Pale Evening Primrose, which is what we find right here uh, in Benton and Franklin counties. Um, but again, absolutely phenomenal plant, huge blooms, uh, really very attractive and, and show-stopping. You can look at this and compare it to the pale evening primrose. Uh, this is the one that prefers the sandy soils. Um, I find this most frequently here locally. Um, again, blooms at the same time, so they're blooming at the same time, but this one really doesn't require any supplemental water, but it can get leggy. It's not as compact. So depending on the soils that our homeowners have, um, and uh, depending on their aesthetic, what they prefer and, and how the plant looks, it'll depend on which plant we recommend to that particular homeowner. So I said originally that, you know, 75% of the plants are native to Washington State. Well, why didn't we go? If we're promoting native plant landscaping, why didn't we go 100%? Well, for the simple reason that most of our native plants, not all, but most of our native plants bloom in the spring. So when we talked about trying to incorporate native plants into traditional landscapes. How were we going to make that aesthetically accept acceptable to the traditional gardener? And we did that by, you know, uh, incorporating in this 25% non-native. And that can include cultivars of our native plants, for example, blanket flower um, and yarrow. I might not include the native white yarrow, but there are many different colors and cultivars of yarrow that do not reseed aggressively. Um, and so here are some additional examples. So prairie uh, coneflower, also known as Mexican hat. It's got the little sombrero uh, hats. It's, it's native uh, to the desert Southwest, but does extremely well in the Columbia Basin. Firecracker penstemon, those red, beautiful red uh, flowers. This plant gets about three feet tall with those um, beautiful plumes of, of, of red. Um, we don't have a lot of red flowering native plants. So here's an opportunity to incorporate this desert Southwest plant um, into our landscapes and, and add that pop of, of red color. Apache plume, I call this our Dr. Seuss shrub from the Southwest. It gets those really cool seed heads on it that looks like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. Um, it's a wonderful addition uh, if you, if you want to a shrub that doesn't require any supplemental water. Um, it's it's a, a fun thing to add. And then Rocky Mountain Penstemon. For our beginning gardeners, uh, Rocky Mountain Penstemon is, lights out one of the easiest plants to grow. It does require some supplemental water. Um, so we have lots of opportunity uh, with our natives, but then we add in some of these other things to maybe add texture, color, and extend the bloom time just so we have gardens that are uh, acceptable maybe to more traditional gardeners and also those neighbors who might not quite understand what, what we're doing. It is important to note that heritage gardens come in all sizes. Uh, when I first started this program, I kept showing a photo of one of my gardeners who did their entire front yard and people thought you had to do your entire front yard. No, you don't have to do your entire yard. I often recommend to homeowners to start with areas 
um, that, that strip of grass where you're not getting enough irrigation water to really grow uh, grass and you're really just getting weeds, or that area that doesn't get any water, that all that is growing in there are weeds. And you want to beautify that and conserve water. Um, those are great places to start with heritage gardening. So I thought we would take a look at some of our gardens. Um, this is Cheryl's Heritage Garden in Richland. And we can kind of see before and after. Cheryl had what I would call, uh, you know, that traditional, you know, strip of grass um, that went down beside her driveway and, uh, you know, her sidewalk. And she really couldn't, no matter how much she watered this area, she could not get that grass to stay green. Um, part of it was that she had um, flood deposits of cobble, <laughs> like six inches underneath. So it was very droughty soil, um, in, high, high infiltration rate. Uh, she really just, no matter how much water she put on, she couldn't, couldn't keep, uh, keep the grass alive. So she took the grass out. She finally decided to stop fighting it uh, and she installed a heritage garden. And we'll take a look at that. Before I change, change uh, slides, note that she has that typical concrete edging, right? We've all seen that concrete edging. We probably, most of us have it in our landscapes, but I wanna show you what she did. So here's a close up. And uh, you can see that she incorporated a dry riverbed uh, into her garden. And uh, she used many different uh, textures of, uh, of rock, of basalt, um, and, uh, you know, just she did an absolutely uh, beautiful job. She's also an artist. I do, we do have to, to say that, I have to admit that she, she is an artist and a retired teacher. Um, but she did a wonderful job. Uh, I especially like um, how she has uh, incorporated, if you look at the, the photo on the right, she has incorporated um, the larger pieces of basalt sort of along the slope. She didn't take out the concrete edging. Uh, it was too expensive and it was too difficult for her to do. So she basically took those larger basalt boulders and put them at the base and then backfilled behind the concrete edging. So she basically covered it up. So it's there, you just don't see it. Um, and then she planted her, her native plants. Uh, you also notice along the sidewalk where she sort of created this undulating pattern of uh, basalt mulch. And I, and I asked her, I was like, you know, Cheryl, why, why did you do that? I mean, it looks beautiful, but I was curious as to why. Well, she's also a retired teacher. And she would watch the kids walking uh, to school every day. And inevitably, they would not stay on the sidewalk. They would step into her garden. So that beautiful undulating pattern of uh, basalt mulch is really meant to be uh, an extra area uh, where the ki if the kids step off, they're not stepping on plants. She didn't plant any plants into it. Um, and it also gave her a place to put snow uh, when she was, uh, you know, basically shoveling, shoveling the sidewalk. Uh, native plants don't really appreciate being buried under feet and feet of snow. We do get some snow here, but when you start compounding it with all the snow that you're shoveling, they, they don't appreciate that. Uh, so she, she was very smart in her creation of her heritage garden. This is Reg and Sheila's garden in Kennewick. And they had the very typical, uh, circle of grass and traditional landscaping kind of off to the side. They have a, a, a circular driveway and it really wasn't adding anything uh, to the landscape. And all they had to do is they, you know, they had to go mow it and he's a musician and he travels and he felt bad every time he left that, you know, he had all of this yard work um, that his wife who was a doctor uh, had to had to do. So they took out all of that landscaping in that area and uh, installed their heritage garden. So you can kind of see the before and after there. And my favorite thing about this is that they did not know that there was a boulder <laughs> <laughs> in the middle, we'll go back real quick. See all of those shrubs, there's a beautiful boulder, a geologic feature already in their garden and they couldn't see it. And no one could see it and no one could appreciate it. 
And so when they were during the discovery phase uh, and they were removing all of the existing vegetation, um, you know, we uncovered this beautiful boulder. And so we incorporated it into their planting plan and had it sort of the central focal point of their walkway, their pathway. Um, and pathways are important in gardens. Uh, they provide us opportunities to access the garden, right? So you can do your maintenance, uh, but it also increases the enjoyment. Having pathways walking through, you can sort of create separate planting beds um, and, uh, you know, it really gives you an opportunity to showcase the plants a little bit better as well. So down in the bottom left corner, there is that fragrant evening primrose, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and when this photo was taken in the upper left corner, the white is uh, snow buckwheat just starting to bloom. It blooms uh, late summer, early fall, and we've got rabbit brush blooming there in yellow. And beside the rabbit brush, you can see that orange red flower. That's a cultivar of blanket flower. Um, and so many, many different native plants adding texture and interest, blooming at different times, um, really provides that, that interest in the garden. This is Martin's garden in Pasco. And look at that beautiful square piece of lawn. <laughs> not really, it wasn't doing much for Martin and these are his words, not mine. Um, but he was like, why, why, why would they do this? <laughs> what am I supposed to do with a square patch of lawn? Uh, and so he wanted to incorporate um, native plants. Part of the Heritage Garden program is we do uh, provide them with a planting guide. Um, you know, we provide them with plant lists that are specific to the soil that they have, to the light requirements, to the water uh, that they have available. Um, but then we take all of those plants that they select, that they choose from the plants that we recommend, and we can create these inspirational guides. They're not landscape plans. We don't go to that level of detail, but it just gives them a general idea of how to uh, incorporate those plants um, so that you have different colors and textures and, and the heights make sense and, and how many you might need if you were a DIYer. And this is Martin's garden after. Um, he wanted to create some very narrow pathways uh, and this is extremely, extremely sandy soil. Um, it's, it's, it's sand, <laughs> there's no other way to say it. It's basically pure sand. <laughs> um, but he had these beautiful erratics, uh, granite, uh, you know, erratics that he had picked up. Um, and then, so he just basically left his pathways bare because they, they were just sand, he didn't cover them, but he used uh, basalt mulch to cover the remainder of the area and incorporated those uh, granite boulders just to provide a, a pop of color. Um, he even went out and uh, found a sagebrush that um, had died uh, and, uh, you know, brought home a piece of it to incorporate into, into his garden uh, to add some additional structure and interest. Uh, but he just did a phenomenal job. Um, again, it's important to note, the only things we're providing to our homeowners are technical assistance. We're not providing financial incentives for homeowners to do this. We don't have the money. Uh, so they're doing it all on their own uh, with a little bit of uh, technical assistance from their conservation district. Demonstration gardens. Um, are extremely, extremely important. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, I can, you know, provide custom plant lists to homeowners. I can show them pictures, but really having opportunities for people to get out and actually see the plants, um, there's no substitute. So we have partnered uh, with many different organizations to provide opportunities and demonstration gardens. Uh, the Master Gardeners, uh, the Benton Franklin uh, Master Gardeners here in our area have an amazing demonstration garden um, here uh, in Kennewick. And they have different gardens that they've highlighted, everything from tree gardens to rose gardens. Uh, and they also have a native plant and a Zurich garden, uh, two separate gardens, they're side by side. But the conservation district, uh, 
partnered with them. We wrote some grants to do improvements to those gardens uh, so that they could be certified heritage gardens. Um, we added pathways, uh, signage, uh, and, and we able to purchase some additional plants to add some diversity to those gardens. Um, but you can see uh, how they've incorporated geologic features. We've got big, beautiful basalt boulders. Those were existing in the garden when they created them. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and uh, that top center photo, those are buckwheats in bloom. Again, buckwheats are extremely important. Uh, to native pollinators, so we always try to incorporate buckwheats into our planting plans. Uh, the photo on the right, that is blanket flower in bloom. Absolutely gorgeous. And then uh, the bottom right picture, that is uh, antelope bitterbrush, which is a beautiful large native shrub that we have here. Um, gets about, mm, I'm going to say about mm, six to eight feet tall and just as wide. Uh, but if you're out in the spring and you're out in the shrub step and you sm smell a very sweet smell, it could very well be bitter brush in bloom. It smells extremely fragrant uh, when it's blooming. So uh, again, phenomenal demonstration garden maintained by the master gardeners. I go out in the spring uh, one day a year and uh, help them with spring cleanup, but otherwise it's they're, they're the ones who are maintaining this particular garden. Oh, in 2018, uh, the city of Kennewick approached the Benton Conservation District. They had received a grant from the Recreation and Conservation Office to do improvements to Hanson Park in Kennewick. And Hanson Park is this massive expanse of grass <laughs> and trees, and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but when they pulled uh, the residents of Kennewick, and they were asking them what type of amenities they wanted to see in their parks. They wanted to see uh, native plants. They wanted to, you know, have an area in their in their parks where they could go and and see native plants and sort of walk through those types of areas. So the city of Kennewick approached the conservation district and the heritage garden program and asked if we would help. Um, uh, create this garden. And so we worked with them to uh, basically create a planting plan for the garden. And uh, it was a phenomenal opportunity to really demonstrate, create a, a garden that would demonstrate the different aspects and the different plants that we often incorporate into a heritage garden. Um, so some of the plants that you see on your screen, um, so that's uh, the purple that you see, the spiky purple plants. Uh, that is gay feather. It's not native to Washington, uh, but it is a, a low water use Midwest plant that the pollinators absolutely love. That pop of orange uh, down um, in the lower center, that is a cultivar of um, echinacea or coneflower. Um, and so it's an absolutely beautiful plant. We have had an entire row of that planted. Um, and I will tell you, pocket gophers really like echinacea. Yeah, we had a little pocket gopher <laughs> infestation last year. And uh, we had this planted in a, like I said, in a linear row. And they uh, went down and ate every single echinacea plant in the garden. Uh, sought them out and ate them. Uh, the good news is, is that none of them got COVID. Um, but we have no more echinacea in the garden, um, but it is what it is. We'll replant with something else that they find a little less tasty. Um, uh, let's see, in the upper right corner, you can see uh, Lewis's blue flax. Uh, beautiful, beautiful plant, uh, pollinators love it. And again, uh, down in the uh, lower right corner, you can see um, a primrose, and uh, beside it is Blue Mountain Prairie Clover, and there's a bumblebee, I believe, on that one, if you can, if you can see that. And uh, what's blocked by my screen on the very far right-hand side is Globe Mallow, and uh, that is a Globe Mallow bee in that Globe Mallow. So they have a special relationship. There is a Globe Mallow bee uh, that collects pollen from that Globe Mallow plant. And so that's what you see there. He's kind of climbed inside, just hanging out. Mm -hmm. And here's another picture of uh, the garden that we took this spring. 
of, of the Hanson Park Heritage Garden, uh, it is 20,000 square feet of awesomeness. Um, and uh, I maintain the garden uh, in partnership uh, with uh, some volunteers uh, that we have, mostly my partner in crime, Donna Lucas, who created the program. She and I both live close to this particular garden, uh, but we have an agreement with the city of Kennewick uh, to uh, basically coordinate volunteers to help maintain the garden and the district in turn gets to use it uh, we don't have to pay any park fees uh, to use it as a demonstration garden and to host events here. So it's a great partnership. Um, it's just a little extra work, but hey, what else do I have to do on the weekend but go play with plants, right? Now, spring cleanup, once we get spring cleanup done, uh, the way that we've designed this garden is it's exceptionally low maintenance. So it's actually pretty easy to maintain. One of the things I wanted to point out in the design of the garden um, is if you look at the city of Kennewick's logo, there is a line kind of going through it, the swoop, if you will. We incorporated that into the pathways of the garden. So the central pathway uh, going through the garden mimics their logo. And, uh, and then the sun in their logo, we uh, mimicked with a, a planting um, in the garden itself. And then, um, we, you know, my daughter basically said, well, mom, you, if you've got that, that line going through the, the city of Kennewick's logo is supposed to represent the river. If you have the river and they have the sun, you have to have a rainbow. And so uh, in the bed, you'll see uh, those lines, those linear plantings. Uh, the red is uh, pine leaf penstemon. It's uh, again, native to the Southwest. Um, and then we just go orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet too. And we have different plants uh, that have those different flower colors uh, that represent those. So lots of fun things that you can do uh, when you're designing these uh, educational gardens, uh, including incorporating, you know, logos into pathways, uh, just go crazy. Plant people are kind of crazy, so you, you can go crazy too. Don't, don't make me be out here all by myself. <laughs> so, okay, so what resources do we provide? So I talked about we provide information on creating a heritage garden. So we do free site visits to homeowners. And I cover Benton and Franklin counties, and I do about 60 site visits a year. Um, I have, uh, a coordinator who covers Yakima County and Autry, and she does about the same on an annual basis in, in Yakima County. So all told, between Benton, Franklin, and Yakima, we're right around 120 uh, site visits. Um, we create custom plant lists for each of those homeowners, uh, looking at, again, looking at their soils, uh, really talking about what level of maintenance they want to do. Uh, are they okay with plants that reseed? Or are we going to try to find native plants um, and cultivars that are sort of a once and done type of thing? Um, and then we kind of, we create those, those planting guides uh, so that they have an idea of how to incorporate those native plants into their landscapes. And for gardens that meet the heritage garden criteria, uh, we do certify them. And then they get, ooh, ooh, they get a yard sign. And you would be shocked and amazed, maybe you wouldn't, maybe you have programs where you offer signage to homeowners, but it's always amazing um, how, how much people want the sign. <laughs> in fact, they're like, now if I do a garden in my front yard and I do one in my backyard, can I get two signs? <laughs> and I'm like, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, the signs are not that expensive. Um, but they, they definitely uh, make a difference. However, if we have homeowners who don't want to meet the certification criteria, that's okay too. If you think about our goals and objectives, we're really trying to um, provide that educational piece so people are comfortable incorporating native plants into their landscapes. And whether they you know, have 75% native, maybe it's only 50% native, um, that's okay. We're going to provide them technical assistance. They just don't get the sign and the bragging rights. This particular program has so much information and uh, so many resources, uh, we created its own website. Uh, so you can find information at hgcd.info. Um, we have plant lists, 
and vendor lists. Uh, so if a homeowner wants to um, hire a contractor uh, to implement their heritage garden or they want to uh, hire a landscape architect, so I give them preliminary information and I'm like, this is great, I'm going to go hire a landscape architect. We have a list. It's not a recommended use list, uh, but it does indicate who has worked on these type of landscapes. So we've done some surveying and some checking uh, with firms to see um, you know, who, who is knowledgeable in this field. We also have our uh, plant vendor list and we give that to every homeowner. So like, here are all of the nurseries, local and regional, where you can find resources um, you know, to, to basically find the plants that you need. Uh, to uh, install your gardens. And we have um, virtual tours of, of the gardens that we have certified. So homeowners can go even look at even more gardens. Um, outreach elements for this type of program, we do, well, before COVID, we did workshops, <laughs> which have turned into webinars. Uh, and we found that, you know, we would have 80 individuals easily at one of our in-person workshops, but we're having over a hundred uh, individuals register for our webinars because we can reach such a, you know, a larger audience. So we will probably, post-COVID, uh, instead of doing two workshops a year, we will probably continue with one webinar a year so we can bring in as many people as we can and we'll, we'll go back to having an in-person event uh, as well. Every couple of years, we do garden tours uh, where we rent a bus and we load everybody up um, and we take them around to certified gardens. That's always fun. Uh, plant sales are, um, we don't do plant sales here at the Conservation District, but our uh, local chapter of the Native Plant Society does. And so uh, we work with them and uh, have a booth at their events to sort of educate uh, folks about the program. And there's always opportunities through community planting projects. Uh, we partner, again, with the Native Plant Society and other entities and uh, get out in the field and, and meet people that way. So um, as Bill mentioned, we did uh, publish a book, uh, Plant Selection Guide, Heritage Gardens of the Columbia River Basin, Donna and myself. This was a really, really long process, um, but, uh, but it was done and we published it right before the pandemic, yay. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, it is available for sale uh, for $27 through the uh, Columbia Basin chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society. So if you're interested, it's 160 some pages with just uh, numerous, numerous, numerous native plants. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. And here's an example of uh, one of the pages in the book. Again, you can see that we have all of the information on the plants, the bloom time, size, water, light requirements, and soil, as well as all of those tidbits um, and symbols for easy reference and phenomenal photos from Donna and many of our partners. All right, so uh, just to let you know, program funding, uh, who funds this particular program in Benton and Franklin counties, the program is offered again free of charge to residents. Uh, and we use, we are a rates and charges district in both Benton and Franklin, we're very, very fortunate. So we really use rates and charges funds in Benton um, with a little bit of commission with a, our implementation funding and in uh, Franklin County, um, it's predominantly, uh, it's a slightly smaller program, so we just use uh, some of our implementation funds for uh, the Heritage Garden program here. And in 2018, we expanded into Yakima County in partnership with the North and South Yakima Conservation Districts. And uh, funding for Heritage Gardens in Yakima County is provided by the Municipal Subgroup of the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan through a grant from the Washington State Department of Ecology. And we just received notice uh, that they are going to uh, re-up our funding uh, for this next biennium. And so this fall, we are hoping to uh, expand the program into Kittitas County in partnership with the Kittitas County Conservation District. Uh, again, funding through uh, the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan for those particular counties. 
So um, again, I think, you know, there is nothing stopping conservation districts uh, from having Heritage Gardens of the Puget Sound to Heritage Gardens uh, of the Palouse. Uh, so I would encourage you if this is a concept, um, I'm always happy to talk to conservation districts about what we, um, you know, how you can partner with your local chapter of your Washington Native Plant Society uh, to sort of offer these type of, uh, this type of programming to, to your, to your districts. It's, it's been a lot of fun. So happy to answer any questions. Hi Heather, thank you so much. That was really wonderful to listen to. You're a great presenter. We got uh, so many comments in the um, question box about how engaging it was and, and how fun it was to look at all those native plants. I'm now really excited <laughs> to own my own house one day and, and get to do my own little heritage garden type of thing. So that was really fun. Um, so thank you. Uh, I do have a couple questions in the question box. Um, you just mentioned some funding. Sarah mm -hmm. was wondering, are there any other specific funding sources for this work? So I would say, um, you know, because we designed the program to be so holistic, to have all of the different aspects of the cultural significance of the native plants, um, you know, and those different the water conservation aspect, look for opportunities there. Um, do, if you have local tribes, um, do they offer grants? Um, because you can say, you know, we want to promote educating our, our community about the cultural significance of native plants and the importance of native plants. They would probably be very interested uh, in funding you. Um, pollinator, the pollinator aspect of Heritage Gardens uh, is tremendous. In fact, we actually created an iNaturalist page for the Hanson Park Heritage Garden to document um, the fact that, yes, if you build it, they will come, even in the urban landscape. So look for opportunities uh, there. And keep in mind too, you can use implementation funds for pollinator habitat, uh, wildlife habitat, however, whatever you want to um, call this type of landscaping, it's it's just uh, organized, more formal habitat. So you, you might be able to find some funding there. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then Stacy was wondering, where can we find the book um, that you released last year and published? Yeah, so if you're interested, you can go to our website, um, hgcd.info and there's information on how to purchase the book there. You can purchase it uh, from the, if you want to purchase it from online, the Washington Native Plant Society has it in their uh, in their store and you can pur purchase it through them, uh, but they, there's a little bit of a higher markup. <laughs> or you can just email me, we, we, we can get you a copy. Awesome, thank you. And then uh, it looks like Rob has a question. So Rob, it looks like you're self-muted. So whenever you'd like to go for it, you're you're all set. Thanks, Stephanie. And thanks, Heather. Um, I was really interested towards the end, you mentioned that you had lists of recommended contractors, landscape architects and plant uh, providers. Um, that's something that I'm looking at creating here in Pierce Conservation District for some rain garden stuff. And I'm curious what some of the sensitivities you had to keep in mind when creating those lists and, and things for folks like me to keep in mind as, as we're exploring something similar. Right. Well, I, I would definitely look at, um, go onto the website and pull up our vendor lists and look at the caveat at the bottom. <laughs> this is not a recommended use list. <laughs> so keep keep that in mind because the first time a homeowner has an issue with a contractor you're going to hear about it um so and, and again the other aspect is is being very sensitive to the contractors um i don't think i've ever had to remove someone from the list uh but but that's a possibility um if if you have homeowners and, and they say that they do this type of work and then they go to the contractor and the contractor's like you don't want to do that. That's, you know, native plants are awful. Um, you know, you might have to you take that into consideration. So I we came up with a, a group of a list of questions. So we were asking all of the vendors the same question and allowing them the opportunity to answer those questions. 
Um, and no one really had any issues. The only issues we came up with were the, um, the geologic providers because we wanted to know where they sourced their materials from. One of the things that makes heritage gardening sustainable is we encourage the use of local materials. So where are they, where are they getting it from? Are they shipping it from Montana? Well, you know, we're kind of hoping they're a little bit more local uh, than that. Or are they bringing up material from Arizona? Uh, some, some people wouldn't say where they were getting their materials from, which then kind of makes you question, are they sourcing their material legally? <laughs> So if they don't answer the questions, they don't get on the list. That's kind of the first, the first uh, hurdle. Uh, and then you just have to be have to be sensitive. Um, one of the things I started doing uh, with our vendor list, especially for landscape companies, um, I started putting on there um, whether they had done certified heritage gardens, whether they had implemented. A, a garden and that sort of starts parsing out you know the people that say yes they do it but they really don't do it and the folks that that actually do um, so that that was a little trick that I've learned in the past couple of years we've started doing that awesome thank you uh, and then Sarah had another question that um, asks aside from your book are there co uh, comparable native plant field guides for east of the Cascades question mark. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so our book is really focused on gardening. Um, and so, uh, and it is probably one of the few books that is. Um, there is Sagebrush Country, uh, which is a, a great um, book. Uh, again, more talking about what you're going to see out in the field. Um, there is, oh, the Wildflower book, uh, Turner and sorry I cannot remember the other author um, but that's just wonderful photographs um, of, is that of, Nancy Turner mm, no it's not Nancy um, oh. um, but on the Native Plant Society's website the Columbia Basin chapter they have a list of all of those uh, different uh, resource materials uh, in addition that you can uh, find but they're not focused on gardening and that's why we wrote the book because the book really gives homeowners uh, an opportunity to to learn about the plants but to really do it from a gardening perspective and that, that's what we found was missing i had one quick question heather and i apologize if i missed this and i guess i'll put myself on webcam since we'll be close to transitioning here shortly um was um whether or not the Heritage Garden program, you link that up with your plant sale. I apologize if you mentioned that, or if you guys have a plant sale. I was just thinking about how we have our native plant sale here at Whidbey mm -hmm. and thinking about like, wow, this could be like a really cool tie-in, you know, like really bringing in that program with the plant sale plants. But yeah, I was wondering if that's been something you've done. Uh, it's, it's not only because we don't do a plant sale, but our partners do. So the Columbia Basin chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society does have an annual plant sale. And it is so much fun to have a booth at their plant sale um, and to see my heritage gardeners come in with their plant lists because that's one of the things that I give them um, is an Excel spreadsheet of all the plants and their planting plan. And, and you see them come in with their shopping list uh, and, and they're like, I'm here to get my plants. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to see. And then to meet the people that I haven't met that are doing this all on their own without any assistance from us. There are a lot of those folks. And then they come by and they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know, I didn't, I hadn't heard about you, but I'm here to buy plants. And I'm like, well, let's, let's go shopping together. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so it, it is, it would be, a, it is a great, um, it, it's, it's a great pairing. Great, excellent. I know that we're getting close to transition time. A few questions did come in. Um, I'm gonna encourage Sarah and Ashley, you have good questions and maybe Heather, um, if you're willing to write your answer in the questions box, I believe yes. you have the ability to see those questions. Um, Ashley asked about a, if you have a customized planting list template that you work off of just to help them think through um, theirs and okay. if you, you know, if you could in, give insight around, 
you know, the use of the cultural um, and heritage garden aspect as a marketing tool over like wildlife gardens, like what, you know, what made you guys choose that? So if you don't mind answering those while we transition, um, yes. just really appreciate this beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And uh, yes, get out there, plant some native plants. And if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me and uh, feel free to email me email me anytime if you're bored once a presentation don't don't hesitate to ask we're we're happy to connect you with some resources um, any way we can thank you so much heather